No other way. <laughs> All right. So uh, in January of 1862, we still don't know where Porter Putnam is, but a, a record rain occurs throughout the state of California, and the Tule River floods dramatically, changing its course. Tule River residents uh, will wake up to find the river has uh, chartered a new course nearly one mile to the south of where it had been, uh, where it had flown. So basically, Main Street is where the old um, Tule River used to flow, basically, through this area right here. So 1863, we pick up back where Porter Putnam's back in this area in February. Uh, Putnam buys 40 acres of swamp and overflow land from Peter Goodhue for $200. Uh, the land sits atop where the Tule River had run prior to 1862 flood. More than 10,000 people a year traverse this section of the Los Angeles Stockton Road. Putnam owns an 18, a Model 1851 Colt Navy revolver in graves the year 1863. So that gun is on display here, and this is a gun that I quested for for like 30 years, and I was able to acquire it uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, and then ultimately I acquired all of Porter Putnam's personal effects, his jewelry, everything, yes? So this is a little before this. If the river was running, would it be going, which way would it go on the Main Street? Bill Horse would know that. Mm -hmm. which, way was the, which way was the river flowing on Main Street? I'm sorry. Go which, way was it, which way was the Tule River flowing on Main Street? Which direction was it flowing? Tule River. I'm deaf as a post. Yeah. <laughs> Working on again some hearing aids. So, so Don, Don, Don Silver would like to know which direction was the Tule River flowing on, uh, you know, when it was, of course, right here along Main Street. Well, the direction? Tule River early on in the 1850s and early 60s came in where the slough is today, around the end of the hill called Murray Hill, went over to 2nd and 3rd Street and went north. If you get into town and go on Morton Street across Main to where the Oaks Club is today, you go off a little hill. Well, you would have been driving in to the bed of Tule River. It went on north where the Ford Garage is today on North Main, would have been in the bed of Tule River. Then it turned and went through the corner of Zalig Park. When a survey was done on Zalig Park, the surveyor called me and said, I have something you would like to see told me where to go. I went to his survey spot, which is now under a parking lot on the north end of Zalit Park on the south side of Henderson. And there's a little ball diamond, baseball diamond there. And he showed me the post that was placed there in 1853. And it's still there because proof of the first survey must be left by law. And the note that he had was by the surveyor and it said the post is 40 or 50 feet from the corner of Peter Goodhue's corral in the bed of Tule River. Peter Goodhue's place was right up on the hill where the intersection of Maine and Henderson is today. That was Peter Goodhue's place. Peter Goodhue so came here once upon a time with the Packwood party. And they rode through Porterville, came in over by where Date and Plano are today, and you have that little curving section. That curving section is part of the original West Road that went around the west side of Tule River when there wasn't much water flowing. It crossed Tule River at Pete's Crossing or Goodhue's Crossing, which is mentioned in the Visalia paper in the 1850s and early 1860s. In 1862, 
the paper says the flood waters on Tule River were in the yard of J.P. Murray's house. That surprised me because I knew where J.P. Murray's house was at that time. Porterville Golf Course Clubhouse is just a few yards south of where Murray's house was. I took that contour line out on a modern topographical map. It goes almost to Success Market area and then comes back on the south side bank and is halfway up the bank out by what we used to call the Porterville State Hospital. In the 1930s, like 37, 38, there was a flood. I remember it. My dad put me on his shoulders because out where we lived, the water was up over top of his rubber boots. I did some research and listening. I listened to my grandfather and my dad talk to others about that high water in 38, 37, 38 winter. And one of the people that they dealt with lived on that hill where the palm trees are right next to where today there's a state fire station. Wilco Mance was that man. And his home was where the palm trees are just by the fire station. He said, you boys, now this is what my dad and granddad were telling others after the 38 flood. You boys ain't seen high water in this part of the country until it's halfway up on this bank. I remember that. And when I saw that in the paper years ago, and took that contour line, the contour line is halfway up on that bank out by the state hospital and on a straight line across to the golf course clubhouse at the city golf course over by Murray Park. 1862 that ran level full of water and changed the river to where it is today. It stayed there. It's been there since 1862. In 1868, there was another flood that wiped out some buildings out what became Plano. Plano was there in 1868. Nothing was out there in 62. The Vice City paper said there is but little damage on Tule River except for fences and livestock. If you want to read that Vice City paper from June, 1859 on up until more modern times it's on file at the county library in Visalia and I've read it page by page advertisements and all from the first publication in June of 1859 all the way up until the early 1870s. The advertisements made a difference because they told you where these people were, mm -hmm. so just like your story about Aurora and Porter's Place. So Bill. Was it Porter Putnam or was it? We're not sure, but we know he was with. Bill. We know he was with them when he was counted. Right, yeah. So is this going to be pertinent to the topic? So look, yeah, the yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to get back. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, overflow land for Peter Gucci for two hundred dollars. A little louder, John. All right. Uh, so I, I, read, I read that part. So next next slide, please. All right. Eighteen sixty four. 
uh, Putnam has his 40 acres uh, surveyed into commercial lots and blocks by Johnny Mac Meckley. Porter has built a structure under a pair of large oak trees. It is a two-story batten board building located at what will become the corner of Oak and Main Streets. It served as an inn, restaurant, saloon, and store known as Porter's Tule River House. Five business blocks are laid out. Putnam ventures east to visit family and, and to wed. So this, uh, this building, this photograph is taken in 1864, the very first photograph of, of Portugal. So uh, at, prior to that, this was called Tule River, the settlement of Tule River. Porter Putnam uh, establishes its Tule River House. Uh, today, uh, the Palace Hotel <coughs> building sits on its spot. Recently, we were able to find the foundation for this building by digging underneath that building. And we we're very lucky to get that opportunity. And so, anyways, this is where everything began right here for Porterville. And in this photograph, I believe, is Porter Putnam, his new bride, who comes back with in 64. I'm not sure who the other people are, um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about what's going on here. So that building sits on what would become Main Street. Oak and Main Street. Yeah. So that's the very corner. And that's, that's, and I actually got to do a dig there prior to finding the foundation. Found all kinds of wonderful artifacts and things. They're on display also in the Port Putnam display here at the museum. So was Main Street then part of the trail or the? Yeah, so that was on the Los Angeles Stockton Road. And 10,000 people a year traverse that to get to basically Stockton and to the gold mining regions. So they went over our new Main Street. That right. was part of that. Exactly. And that's that's why Porter Putnam ultimately was successful because of the traffic that he had here. So yeah. part, part yes. so that what is the that that's Main Street and what is the Oak Main Street. Street. Main and Oak. Main and Oak. And okay. the reason it's called Oak is because these two giant oak trees. Oh my goodness. Trees. They weren't there like twenty years later, they were gone already. But uh, but yeah, that's uh, yeah. wow. So this is really the first building on what would become Portable's Main Street. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so yes. Porter Putnam called that place the Tule River House. That's right. Porter's Tule River House. Yeah. And he had a sawmill. I heard you mention that. The people on the res years ago, when I was very young called it Brown's Mill mm -hmm. and Brown's Spring. It was by a spring, and I went up there in the middle 1960s to the site. Mm -hmm. There's still parts of the metal pieces from the mill laying around where that little flat is where the mill was. Yeah. Years ago, I talked to a man who was born up north and moved to the area that we now call Sausalito and Deer Creek, six miles east of Pixley. Failing was his last name, and they came to the area, purchased property, came in to the town of Porterville, and this was in 1874, 75. When I talked to him, he was 90 plus years old. Right. He said they took two wagons, and he was one of the kids that was like five or six years old at that time. Uh, they went up to that sawmill. What, one minute. We're losing customers, so <laughs> I'm going to try to speed up the talk. We're losing, we're losing our audience, so I want to make it shorter. So I'm going to get back to my talk, but I appreciate that's important information. I wrote that down. You told me that before. That's great information. You need to write it up in a good book. Like, little book. All right. So in the summer uh, of '64, Porter visits family in Covington, Pennsylvania, and marries Mary Jane Packard on April 4th at uh, Chinoga County, New York. Um, all right, this is, this is an important part because this describes really what you're looking at here in this picture. In August of 1864, Porter and his new bride arrive in the village of Tule River. 
They traveled via clipper ship and the Panama Isthmus, bringing with them their wedding gifts, among which were a mahogany secretary desk, which is on display in the room back here, and chest of drawers. One of Mary's new friends, Martha Louise Baker, wrote an article in later years describing her arrival. When Porter Putnam, founder of Porterville, returned from an Eastern trip in 1864, bringing with him his bride, the small settlement received her with welcome arms. Putnam staged a big party for his bride and at his local hotel building, which is this building. And, this, and, the soon, and she soon became the social leader in the affairs of the little settlement. Mary wrote of her experience in later years. So this is Mary's words, his wife. We arrived at Visalia and came to Tule River, our future home, by private conveyance. We found a comfortable home. It seemed odd to see a Chinaman in the kitchen cooking. The weather was very hot, as it was the month of August. I began to get a little homesick, but the California fruit made things all right. My husband had some of his land surveyed into town lots and built a small store on the opposite side of the street, opposite this place, and rented <coughs> our first home for a hotel. Then we built our home close by the store, which was filled with uh, dry goods and groceries. We did a good business beyond our expectations. Another article from 1896 by a participant of the party uh, gives another great uh, detail. So this is a, a friend of theirs. Uh, such a crowd as our little town had never dreamed of. Visalia, Woodville, and Havila were all represented. We literally danced till daylight. Uh, memory, uh, in memory, I can see the long, narrow room, which would be inside of this building, with its low ceiling and candlelight walls, while among the happy throng were bright young faces that are now wrinkled and crowned with snowy hair. There was uh, our host and hostess, Mr. and Mrs. Royal Porter Putnam, Mr. and Mrs. J.P. Murray, Mr. and Mrs. J.B. Hockett were there also. A few months after this, I think Mr. Putnam built his new store uh, across the street from the hotel. And uh, so let's move on to our next picture. I want you to see, this is Mary Putnam. So this is what she looked like at the time she married her husband. She's young here. She would outlive him by many, many years, and she got to see Portugal you know, turn into a, a really wonderful city. So that's her as, as a young lady. Um, 1865, Porter and Mary Putnam have their first child, William Porter Putnam, born June 16th in 1865 at their home. 65 is also likely the year that Porter builds his small store, as Mary calls it, it is seen in a late 1860s photograph showing the Wells Fargo and Company. Next slide. This is their second, they, they built this across the street from that first building we saw. So this is the second photograph ever known of Porterville. And we're lucky to have at least a copy print of it. We have the original of the other one, but this is a copy print. You can see the Wells Fargo sign on there. So he was also a Wells Fargo agent here. This is Port Putnam here. This is the house he built next door for his wife. That's his wife. Yeah, so that house stayed there until 1889. Uh, it kept building more and more uh, bigger uh, businesses next to this. And he moved the house over a lot. And then in 1889, uh, he had the whole house picked up and moved onto Mill Street. Uh, so he could build his brick building in 1889. Do you have a question? Yes, oh, what is the name? Oh, when, they, when they moved that house. I'm sorry, this gentleman back here had a question. The name before store? That says? says Putnam store. Oh, so, oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And so, and your question, Bill? When they moved that house, they moved it over on the corner of Third and. Uh, Mill? Well, right next to where the Porterville Recorder Office is on yes, today. Yes, exactly. On that corner. And unfortunately, they tore this beautiful house down in the, in the 1980s for no good reason. Yep. Destroyed it. You know, the, the most important yeah, house in all of Porterville. So, yeah, so, yeah, here again, this is Porter, this is his wife, and she's probably holding her first child there, and don't know who these people are, but, you know, Wells Fargo is legendary in the history of the West, and so this is a Wells Fargo stage station. Yes, sir? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, that's a Porter's store there, but it's named Putnam? And yeah, so he's calling it Putnam's store, which is interesting because everything after that, I'm pretty sure he's, you know, because yeah, uh, we want to, well, I 
remember, remember the theory is uh, everything was Porter because... Well, by this time, the other Putnams had left the area. Oh, okay. So now he was the only Putnam in oh, town. Okay. So now he could take claim of that name. Oh, okay. Actually, early on, they they weren't sure if they were going to call it Portersville or Putnamsville. Oh, okay. and, but but uh, they chose Portersville and then dropped the S later. Okay. Um, John? Yes. And the book... In the Bicentenary paper, in those first few years, when Charles Putnam was in the area, they started advertisements, and the advertisements showing up were Putnamville, another week or two or a month, Portersville, right. and I mean, they just swapped around. Yeah, they, they ultimately, ultimately chose Portersville. Porter. Yeah. Uh, so 65 is like, okay, so, um, all right, let's skip ahead. All right. 1869, the Putnams have a second son, Samuel Eugene Putnam, on February 7th. Uh, sadly, the infant dies on October 28th of the same year. The Putnams bury their son at the Vandalia Cemetery, Plano. So if you go to the Vandalia Cemetery, if anybody's ever been out there, you'll find their, their second son buried out there because there wasn't really a, a, a cemetery founded in Portville yet at that time. So, um, 1871, Porter Putnam and wife are blessed with a third son, Frank Olivia Putnam, on April 10th. Porter builds a new two-story wooden store with a large sign at the top that reads, Our Porter Putnam. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna talk about this gun for a little bit. Uh, that is Porter Putnam's uh, Model 1851 Colt Navy Revolver. Uh, starting at the age of about 17, I started questing for this gun. I wanted to find it. I didn't know where it was. It was pictured in a book from years ago. I asked Bill Horace, I asked Jeff Edwards, I think I even asked you, Dan, do you know where this gun is? Nobody had any answers for me. I tried a dozen times to get that pistol from Mr. Mathic. I know, and you didn't give me a lot of information. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were still holding on to the hope of finding that thing. All so. we ever yeah. really got was the dental tools. Right. So I when, I when I started looking for something, I'm a collector. I can't help it. I quest, and I, I manifest, I look for things, I hunt. And I wasn't gonna give up on finding this gun. And so I started asking around. Somebody gave me a tip that it might be in Jackson, California with a collector that had a pawn shop there. And I knew who this guy was, so I called him and I said, hey, listen, I heard you might have the founder of my hometown's gun. Is that true? And he goes, you know what, that, that sounds familiar. Yeah, I've got hundreds of guns. I think that is one of the guns I have. I said, could I see it? And he goes, nope, click, and hung up on me. So my, my heart sunk and I figured I'll never get it forget it, I'm giving up. I was living uh, in Stockton at the time. Then I came back home to Tulare County, bought my house in Three Rivers. After a couple of years of living in Three Rivers, I was visiting an antique store in town that just opened. It's called Rosemary's Remembrances. And Rosemary started asking me a bunch of questions. She's like, what do you collect? And I said, I collect old photographs, I collect this, I collect that. Well, anything from my hometown of Portugal, I collect. Unbeknownst to me, there was another lady in the shop listening to our conversation. And she says, oh really? My great great grandfather was Royal Porter Putnam and I have his gun. Oh, wow. You could have knocked me over with a feather. I was so shocked. I said, ma'am, I would love to see that. She goes, see it, would you like to buy it? And I said, yes ma'am, I would like to buy that. And she brought it to me that day and she goes, find out what it's worth young man. And when you find out, you can make payments, whatever. So I showed it to Bill and I said, what do you think this gun's worth, Bill? And I think you said about $5,000. So I told her, because it, you know, it did belong to a famous, world famous, and it belonged to this local famous gun. <laughs> and it was an interesting gun. It's got, I love the, the diamonds and hearts on the handle, that's full chart. There's all kinds of other stuff. There's the year 1863, it's engraved on the back strap here. There's a little arrow put in it, a little copper arrow. So I made her payments, $1,000 a month until I got it paid off. By the way, I'm donating this gun to the Portable Museum, if anybody wants to know. Wow. Oh, and I asked her at the time, I said, do you have anything else? I've always looked for this tin type of, of him. I want that too. Oh, I don't know. So on my last payment, she brought me that famous tin type we showed you from earlier, from 1859, really? and she gifted it to me. Oh, wow. So I had like the two things I had been seeking my whole life. I had them. 
And then I asked her, do you have anything else? She goes, oh, no, no. About uh, three years later, she comes into my antique shop in Three Rivers and she says, uh, oh, I kind of lied. I have everything for oh. items. I have his furniture, I have his estate jewelry, I have his papers, I have his photographs. And she goes, I'm going to lose everything here pretty soon because it's in a storage unit and I can't afford to pay the storage unit fee. If you pay off the storage unit, I'll let you buy whatever you want. So I ended up spending another $10,000 with her, bought all Porter Putnam's personal things. Uh, talked the museum into letting me bring them here, which they'll be on permanent display here. When I die, they they belong to the museum. They belong what to the portal. Huh? What date was that? Did that happen? Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, I got the gun before 2011 because I had it during the oh, not too long. Yeah. So, but I got all the other stuff. I think about 2016. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, so it's, it's my honor to be able to preserve this stuff. That stuff would have been lost to history, period. Uh, next slide. This is Porter Putnam's desk that he brought home with him uh, through the Isthmus of Pan Panama. It was a wedding gift to him. And uh, that was one of the things that she wasn't sure which desk belonged to him. She had a couple of desks. And I said, she showed me one desk and she goes, I think this was his desk. And I said, no, this is 1920. So it can't be his desk. Is there an older desk? And sure enough, there was this there. I said, yeah, this is the secretary desk from the 1860s, that's his desk. And then we found a photograph where it was on display uh, with the family at Berkeley. And you could see, and they had the gun sitting on the desk. It was obvious that was his desk. So that now that has its attribution again. Does that have a date on the back of it? Something no, but we know, he, we know it, it was gifted to him in 1864. It was probably built around that same time. But it wasn't easy to bring that, you know, through the Isthmus of Panama and then across, you know. So anyways, that's that. Next slide. All right, this is Porter Putnam's third store. So it says R. Porter Putnam across the top. His second store is here, the little store. You can see that where it said Putnam store. This is Porter Putnam and his first son. This is his wife and their third son that, that lived up top. Again, I don't know who these gentlemen are. But uh, you know, business is getting better. The town is being more established. This is 1870. Is, is that where his house was, and it got moved over? His house is it got moved over. It's sitting back here, so it was set back a little bit. So let's see. Um, John, that's the one on the east side. Yes, it's on the. It's on, no, sorry, it's on the west side. West side, and then uh, this is the third photograph. No, the portable. And it's 18, let's see. About, about 1871 or so. So Mary Putnam wrote later years, in a short time our first store was not large enough, so another was built, a two-story building. The upper story served as a town hall. In a short time, another store was started. Uh, I mean, another business guy who came to town and started a similar store. Uh, a photograph showing the new building is taken that year. Porter po posed out front with others. Mary is seen upstairs holding her new infant. This is the third ever photograph ever known of Porterville. And I have the original of that too. So what happened, Port Putnam had these two sons that lived and got married. Both had daughters. Both daughters had no children. So the, the Porter Putnam lineage is over. There, there is none. But I searched so hard, I was able to find the material that belonged to both daughters. This came from the other daughter. So I was, that, that photograph is a very important photograph. In 1872, according to an article that uh, Mrs. Mary J. Putnam wrote in 1896, in that year, 1872, Portable was a small town consisting of one saloon, a post office, and a blacksmith shop. There was also a hotel and three stores. There was a, neither a church nor a schoolhouse then, but a building that answered for a school for 12 to 12 pu 10 to 12 pupils. She goes on to explain how the ladies of Porterville led the way in raising funds uh, through social and, uh, benefits to make the church and school come to pass. Um, so yeah, if it wasn't for the ladies of Porterville, we wouldn't have had our first school, our first church, none of those things. 1874, Porterville could boast three general merchandise stores, one hotel, two restaurants, two blacksmith shops, two livery stables, and several saloons by that time, two years later. The population was then less than 300. 
Porter Putnam holds notes, lends money, and acquires thousands of acres of land in the region. He is very much the center of his town and has the respect of most, if not all, he deals with. As a collector of debts, he is reasonable and flexible. There being no bank in this part of the county, Porter's safe becomes the town vault. I'd love to find that safe, by the way. It has his name painted on the top, if anybody knows where it is. Uh, so we're going to skip ahead now a decade, 1887. Next slide. Okay, this is Porter Putnam, probably about 1870. He's becoming successful. Next slide. So this is this is when Porterville starts experiencing its Wild West period. Uh, this is the office saloon. Uh, there was literally a saloon on every corner of Main Street at this time. Um, the office saloon was an operation on the southwest corner of Main and Mill Streets. This would later become the Mountain Lion Saloon in about 1889. So yeah, that sign would change to Mountain Lion Saloon later on. And this is 1887. So it, it gives you an idea of what you know people through uh, Porterville, sorry, I said through uh, Porterville looked like at that time. So a lot of you know cowboy types, you know, real rough characters. So John, do we have a picture of this in our display for the Mountain Lion? No, but I have a giant blow-up that I just took down in Mooney Grove, and I'm going to bring it to the museum. We'll find a place for it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay, 1888, uh, everything changes for Portville. Uh, Southern Pacific Railroad comes to Portville. That's a game changer. Uh, everybody else around Tulare County looked down on Portville. They said, oh, that's a saloon town. You know, it's, they, they really put it down. But as soon as we were able to get the railroad through here, it changed uh, the fortunes of Porterville greatly because we had citrus land around. That way we could we could ship the citrus away. And this became a boom town in 1888 because of the railroad. That year, Porter Putnam's 51 years old. He's sitting on top of the world. Like he's seen his little tiny village turn into this very important spot on California's map. Um, unfortunately, uh, the following year, 1889, uh, would be his last year, and he was only 52 years old. So, um, but he's planning to build a new building on on this stretch over here. He's going to build a two-story brick building. From 1888, everything was wood buildings on Main Street. By 1889, 1890, almost everything was brick buildings. They were replacing the wood buildings with brick buildings because it was such a prosperous prosperous business place. All of a sudden, because of the railroad. Uh, 1889 article. Uh, titled Putnam to Build appears in the September 28th paper. Uh, C. Kirby of Fresno is getting out the plans for R. Porter Putnam's new store, which is to be built on the site formerly occupied by Mr. Putnam's private residence. Uh, about $20,000 will be spent in erecting the store. That's a lot of money. And it, his fortune was like almost a half a million dollars when he dies. So this is coming from penniless to like very successful. 1889, October 21st, the founder of Portable, Royal Porter Putnam, dies at the age of 52 after contracting pneumonia. He had already begun plans to construct a grand two-story brick building where his house sat on the west side of Main Street. Uh, he moved his house to the corner of 3rd and Mill Streets in preparation. It was during this move uh, that he became ill while, ca while catching a wet chill during the digging up of a young lemon tree from the original home location. The portable paper stated in part, so ended the career of the pioneer and founder of our beautiful little town, struck down by the hand of Providence in the prime of his manhood. A grand funeral procession was created and signs of mourning draped the town. A fancy metal casket with polished silver handles was borne reverently by 10 pallbearers, uh, Messrs. J.B. Billingsley, <coughs> P. Murray, P. F. Chapman, J. B. Hockett, S. W. J. Uh, Tyler, R. A. R. Henry, L. J. Redfield, C. A. Rose, H. Mintz, and Judge Williamson, preceding the Presbyterian, proceeding to the Presbyterian Church. So the town was in shock because here's this guy. The town is just starting to turn around. Pioneer Land Company is company San Francisco. All kinds of money is coming in from L. A. and Los Angeles, and this is a happening place. And he dies right in the middle of it right in the middle of the transition. When did Pioneer Land Company come in about? So the word Pioneer got used by Porter Putnam as early as like the 1860s. He called the store the Pioneer Store. 
Uh, and so what happened in 1887, 1888, uh, wealthy banking investors from San Francisco came in, Lilienthal the company came in, and they said, we know this is gonna be a happening place. The railroad's here, we have all this citrus land. We're gonna buy up the citrus land, we're gonna sell it. We're gonna, we're gonna develop a water company, we're gonna develop a land company. They built the Pioneer Hotel, they built the Pioneer Bank. All these things with the name Pioneer attached to it was because of this one company from San Francisco. And it, it made Porter a uh, fortune for that time. It was just, it made so a lot of money. What time was that? 18, 1887 to 1889 was when all that started really taking off. And, and he died right in 1889. Okay, 1890, by February, the children and widow of R. Porter Putnam have, ha have completed the building that Porter Putnam had intended to construct. It is an impressive two-story brick building. Next slide, please. That's, this is Porterville's Main Street in 1887, not a single brick building on Main Street. Two years later, almost all brick buildings. Can you show, tell us what those buildings are? Sort of like so this is, this is where Porter and Putnam's Tule River House was. It turned into a hotel. This is Oak and Main. This is the Lick House, which also was kind of a brothel upstairs, I believe. <laughs> this is Porter Putnam's second store. This is Port Putnam's third store. His house is back here, and he's about to build a two-story brick building right here on this spot. So he moves that house on the Mill Street. And then you got Mins. Yeah, Wilco Yeah, Wilco Mins. He was like the right first there. mayor of Porterville, you know, important people. So, you know, the Bakers, the Mints, all these people that came. So what did Mins do? What is it? Is it another kind of work? That's another story. Oh, yeah. yeah, but he was a, yeah, he was a mercantile. He was a mercantile, for sure. Yeah. So, um, next slide. This is uh, Porter Putnam's advertisement in the 1880 uh, Tulare County Directory. Kind of gives you an idea of what he was doing business-wise. So, Pioneer Merchant, there's that word Pioneer. Uh, dry goods, hardware, agricultural, general merchandise, but down here to home seekers, you know, he's selling properties. So, he's also a big real estate guy in town at that time. The next slide. This is him uh, at about age 45. This is close to his death. So he looks he look very distinguished looking now. It's not like he looked like a hippie in that first picture, but he's very, you know, he's a wealthy man by this time. Next picture. This is a pocket watch that came from that estate that I told you about. It's on display here too. It's a silver pocket watch with a gold train on it. I believe that was gifted to him by Southern Pacific Railroad. For his participation in giving them, you know, land for the railroad, uh, and he was that engraving appears in the book. And there's a nice biography about him. This is the year he dies, 1889. Next slide. This is some of his estate jewelry. Those are gold cufflinks, a gold stick pin, another set of gold. So this, this also came from this estate. Next slide. This is uh, Mary Putnam's estate jewelry. Um, so you can see there were there are people of means and wealth at that time. Next slide. Okay, this is his final store. Uh, this is a rendering of what it's gonna look like. And uh, it's two stories, and I'll read about it. Uh, it is an impressive two-story brick building with an ornamental facade and two large roof towers. An iron ornamental fence in outdoor observation deck spans the center of the two pushed out window outer facing. The upstairs is separated into two halls. The masons use the hall on the right uh, on, on the right, the hall on the left was for public functions. At first, Will and Frank Putnam, the sons of Port Putnam, used the entire downstairs as the Pioneer Store, general merchandise emporium. Okay, so that gives you an idea. You know, he he dies right when everything's turning brick. Like this is, you know, this is a this is a portrait of him hanging in the window to memorialize him. It says, R.P. R. Putnam Pioneer Store. That portrait is on display also in the other room. We have the original portrait that hung is, in that window. Is this building still standing on Main Street? So yes, it is still standing. So anybody remember the old thrifties on Main Street? Yeah. All right, so um, what happened in the 1960s, they took this beautiful building and they shaved off the top portion of the building and they modernized it. Like a lot of our buildings on Main Street are old buildings like this and they just modernized the heck out of them in the 50s and 60s. So that building is still there. You can go into the basement of it and see the original brick foundations. 
and everything. I've been there. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't look anything like this anymore, but it's still there. The top, floor is top floor they shaved off. There's a second floor, but it's only like this high. It doesn't go all the way to the top. So they, they did a major overhaul in that building. The Hodgson's did it. We have Hodgson's Hall, <laughs> but they did. They, but that was the thing. They wanted to modernize things at that time. So, so what? What actually is that building now? Today, it's a furniture store. It's a bank, really? Yeah, it's a furniture store today. Yeah. Or is it vacant now? It's vacant. Okay, it's vacant now. All right, next slide, please. All right, this is Mary Jane Putnam. Like I said, she got to live to. Uh, the year 1914, as an elderly lady, she got to see Portoville's renaissance. Like by this time period, Portoville was a very, very upscale, fancy town because of all the money from Citrus. And so I'm gonna read a little bit about her right here. This is the last part, guys. 1914, Mary Packard Putnam passes away in 1914. She and her sons, Will and Frank, are witness to the fulfillment of Porter's dream. Before Mary passes, she writes of her experiences as Portoville's first lady. Those old times of work and pleasure have passed away and we will now look to the new city for health and happiness. Many of the pioneers have passed away to their long homes and newer, nicer buildings are put up where the old ones stood. People can come from the east now, can travel in Pullman cars, reach Porterville and find a pleasant city. They build nice homes and have come to stay. But my heart, with all these changes, whenever I roam, never loses its love for the old house at home. So it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, I we need to know their story. I mean, it's book worthy. I plan on turning this timeline into a book, awesome. well illustrated. Yeah. 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 So, but I think that's very fitting. You know, this woman has seen it all from 1864 to 1914. So. How old is she? Now? That's a very good question. I didn't write it here, but she, I would guess she was probably close to 80 by that time. They old for that day. For that time, yeah. 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 Well, Anyways, that, that's really it. If anybody has any further questions? Yes? Just when you showed that advertisement, it said Porterville and referred to Portersville. And right. Had, had so that's, that's that the S gets dropped sometimes if you look at old advertisements. I think the town was split on that name. Some people called it Porterville, other people called it Porterville. Uh, the post office didn't drop the S until about the time of her death in 1914. Mm -hmm. then, it, then it became Porterville confirmed. But the S was there for a long time, And but you'll go back to the 1870s and see it called Porterville without the S. So they, it was interchangeable. Okay. Do you know when the water system got put in? Like when were the flush toilets? When did they arrive? Well, uh, a lot of things happened earlier than people realize. As early as 1888, we had electricity on Main Street because of Murray's Mill. We had arc lamps on Main Street. We had telephones probably as early as 1890 on Main Street. Uh, flushing toilets, I think they, the sewer system probably didn't get started until around the turn of the century. I think they still had outhouses prior to that. Mm -hmm. So about 1900, I hope okay. to answer your question. My husband and I bought that house over there on the corner, it's the Tom Sawyer Parlor now. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting, it started off, that it was the Bray Wright Lumberyard People's Home. It was just four rooms to start with. And then the next section they add on was the bathroom and the kitchen. And so I thought, well, okay, when it started, it was a really nice house. Mm -hmm. I don't think there were any flush toilets in there. Right, so every, every place had an outhouse and, and uh, bottle diggers love the privies, the old privies, because they can dig down in there and find real bottles of relics and things. And by now it's all clay. It's, it doesn't, it's not poop anymore, it's clay. Yeah. 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 Yes, what year did the uh, IRS become institutionalized? How much of this was tax? <laughs> oh, so yeah, that's a that's a question for somebody else. I know that's changed a lot over the years. They didn't they didn't tax the way they do now back then. It was, you know, they still was taxed, but they, they, that system that code changed so much over the years, mostly in the twentieth century. So, yeah. John, we do have in our gift shop we have Porter Putnam, copies of Porter Putnam's diary. That's right. There's copies of Porter Putnam's diary. If anybody's interested, it's fascinating to read. I would also there's refreshments here. And I also suggest if you have time to check out my exhibit called uh, Discovering Portoville's Pioneer Past. And that's all Port Putnam's personal objects. So there is his gun, his desk, 
All the things you saw in those pictures, you can see in person.